Logic is often linked with reason. Where reason is the motivation behind an action, the reason why one does something, logic is a series of reasons that limit one another to form a suite of actions or a general behaviour. It is a set of principles that underlies the general thinking behind that general behaviour. Logic, as with reason, is not universal. This tends to be generally understood of reason. For example, I might have a reason to want to leave work early while my manager has a competing reason for me to stay. This, however, is less understood of logic, which can also be said for rationality, also often linked with reason. But a rationale is just the consistent application of reason, and logic, as I already mentioned above, is the sequence of reasons alongside and limiting one another. If a man accuses a woman of being irrational, it is more likely that that man simply fails to understand the logic underlying the reason for that woman's behaviour. Logics compete, just as reasons do. Returning to the situation between myself and my manager, it is not necessarily the case that our competing reasons belie competing logics. We might both wholeheartedly agree that the logic to work hard at our company will benefit us both, and it's just a deadly sunny day and I need to get out of the office in that given moment. It's more likely, however, that a manager who will be on a higher pay scale than me, who needs to be managed, is operating from a different logic. The reason they want me to stay to work is informed by the logic of management in a capitalist enterprise. That is, if I sit here and make sure he doesn't move, he will eventually produce the service required by my manager so that I might pass it along and continue receiving my sweet salary. Whereas my reason for wanting to leave early is more likely informed by an altogether different logic such as This is such a menial shitty load of bollocks of a job. There's literally no point in me staying here to produce this service because, as bad as it is, it would be even worse to eventually get that idiot's job, despite better pay. So if I get up and leave for the door and the manager jumps up startled and demands to know where I'm off to, and I tell him I don't care about the job, that I've just got to go, he might try to explain the situation to me according to his logic. You must stay. I implore you. Who will produce this service if you're not here for me to supervise you? You're acting entirely irrational. This is of course wholly antithetical to the logic informing my reason. The conversation doesn't get very far as we bump heads until eventually my manager, failing to grasp my logic and in need of a higher rate of compliance for his logic to be seen through, fires me and I get to leave early. There is no universal logic. They can compete. On March the 4th of this year, Italy had just closed its schools and universities due to having become the European epicentre of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. With 87 known cases in the UK, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson had just told the nation that, as long as they were washing their hands for 20 seconds, people could greet others however they liked. During the weeks that followed, confusion ensued, with some baffled that the government hadn't adopted Italy's policies before the spread of the virus got much worse, and others keen to focus on the it'll be grand aspect of Johnson's message. Johnson assured the nation that more stringent measures were not necessary as the science was sound, that the virus would spread through the population and only kill off the weak, while everyone else built up a natural immunity. On March 16th, the science reported in an online article on the Hoover Institute's website that the standard model of spread was a gross overestimation and that we should also be concerning ourselves with the impending economic shock. But then, on March 18th, the science again reported, this time through a research paper published by the Imperial College London, that things are going to get very bad. In response, Johnson finally closes the schools. Two days later, pubs, restaurants and gyms are also ordered to close. A furlough scheme allowing companies to temporarily lay off staff so that they could stay home and the government would pay 80% of their wages was announced. Then, on March 23rd, Johnson tells the nation to stay home, to only leave for food, medical reasons, essential work if it cannot be done from home, and for one hour's daily exercise. In this five-day period, the world, for those living in the UK, changed dramatically. 43 people were reported to have died, but the figure stood at 11,000 in the wider world. The reality of the virus for the vast majority of people living in the UK was a vague and ambiguous puzzle playing out on their screens. It was largely happening elsewhere. There was, for at least some I guess, a sense that an enemy was imminent, and this feeling was, for me anyway, made even more surreal by Johnson's U-turn with respect to policy. It was as if the Prime Minister began employing a different logic to the one that informed his previous herd immunity policy. 
In contrast to the stark virus realism of a policy of lockdown, many in the financial press were clamouring for us to consider the economy. On March 19th, the Wall Street Journal published a report highlighting the human cost of job losses, claiming that this cost would grow by the hour. It warned that 10 million jobs would be lost, but in case the reader wasn't sufficiently tugged by their heartstrings, the article counted this cost in lost dreams. This sentiment was ramified when on March 23rd, the same day that Johnson delivered virus realism to the UK, the leader of the free world, Donald Trump, announced to the business class that the cure cannot be worse than the problem, and that the US would be out of lockdown sooner rather than later. On March 24th, the Washington Post reported that Trump was coming under increasing pressure from business leaders, Republican lawmakers and conservative economists to reopen the economy. It also reported that Dr. Fauci, a lead member of the administration's coronavirus task force, disagreed with this direction. Competing logics. Capitalist logic determines that today's investments must be valorized tomorrow. That is, if I make an investment on March 22nd, I require economic activity so that the economy grows and I can eventually cash out, having made a gain on my investment, otherwise known as profit. If, however, Boris Johnson effectively shuts down a large economic hub, otherwise known as the UK, on March 23rd, then the chances of valorisation become limited. Yes, I can read in the news that some people are ill and a few of them are dying, but if my capital doesn't valorise, my competitors might outflank and then sink me. This is the logic of capitalism, the logic underlying the reasoning behind Trump's plan to reopen the economy. The logic of COVID-19, however, goes something along the lines of This host is literally killing itself to get rid of me. Perhaps I should try that idiot over there. Nope, just as hostile. Oh, they're dead now. Ah, here's their neighbour to check on them. And so on. This logic, or the one derived from it that goes something like We must stop the virus from spreading and killing its hosts appears to be in direct competition with the logic of capitalism. On March 25th, an article published by the Financial Times declared that shutting industry could inflict lasting damage on economies. On March 31st, another Financial Times article reminded everyone that UK's gross domestic product would shrink 6 billion during each month of lockdown. And on the same day, the BBC relayed the message from the World Bank that the 24 million people they projected to escape poverty now would not. From this two-week snapshot of various policies and reactions in the media, we get a sense of the competition between these two logics. Another two weeks on, and on April 14th, the same day the IMF released their Global Financial Stability Report, the same day, incidentally, that Johnson was released from hospital after having succumbed to the virus two and a half weeks earlier, the UK's Office for Budgetary Responsibility asked the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, to begin reminding everyone of the primacy, after all, of the capitalist logic. Sunak, in his statement to the nation, declared that it was important to be honest with people about what was happening to the economy, stating that he would outline such before turning to the health figures that day. So, before turning to those health figures, Sunak took the time to assure the UK nation that the government had the economy in hand, and that it would be getting everyone back to work as quickly as possible, as soon as restrictions changed, to get businesses moving again and recover the economy. Then, on pivoting toward the health figures, Sunak gave us a direct glimpse down to the bone of the logic, by saying the single most important thing we can do for the health of the economy is to protect the health of our people. Remember, a logic is a sequence of interlimiting reasons. In Sunak's sequence of reasons why the government should act, the economy here comes first, as if people serve the economy rather than the economy serves the people. Four weeks have since passed and, on May 10th, Johnson eased the lockdown to allow more people to travel to work, suggesting also that schools would soon reopen. This policy of easing lockdown comes at a time when virus realism appears to be subsiding. The rate of death linked with COVID-19 is reportedly lowering. The curve seems to have been flattened and the National Health Service managed not to collapse under the weight of its peak. It would appear then that the government is now aware of what sort of numbers the health system is capable of and must be confident it can maximise economic activity within the parameter of cases the country featured over the past two months. I cannot say for sure that this is a conscious policy, of course, but given the virus logic, it at least does not appear to seek to minimise the death rate. And, given the logic of capitalism, the government is technically now aware of how to manage the caseload for the NHS. 
When numbers rise once the economy restarts, the government will know when to cap the second wave and introduce lockdown measures again. The inevitable re-increase of the death rate will be a collateral factor to the continuation of the logic of capitalism and the need to valorise investments. It just so happens that for the business leaders and conservative economists lobbying on behalf of the logic of capitalism, the virus logic affects them least of all. On May 1st, a report was published on the poverty and social exclusion website by the Office of National Statistics that displayed that the distribution of deaths linked with COVID-19 lay increasingly with those from the most deprived areas of England and Wales. Irrespective of the logic of the virus, this is always the logic of capitalism. This distribution pattern is not too dissimilar for deaths not linked to the virus also. And this is an important point, but bear with me for a moment. A few days after the lockdown measures were announced, the NHS put out a call for volunteers. In the first 24 hours, they received over half a million applicants. Mutual aid groups were quickly established across the country, and a poll published on April 9th stated that the British public valued the health and lives of its older population over even long-term economic considerations. Despite a government bent over the lap of the business lobby, as if they weren't thoroughly involved in business themselves, and thus operating under the logic of capitalism, these moments of selflessness illustrate an alternative reasoning among that government's constituents. From this glimpse of reason, we cannot say what logic underlies it, but what we can say, however, is that it doesn't appear to be too concerned with the logic of capitalism. Why then was this not as blatantly apparent before the COVID-19 crisis? As above, the country's death rate is dramatically asymmetrical in its distribution along degrees of deprivation, virus or no virus. Why in this moment do people suddenly seem motivated by human vulnerability? I would guess that this is perhaps because for a moment human vulnerability was honestly depicted in the mainstream media during the early phase of the crisis. Society's comparable endemic vulnerabilities that existed before and will exist long after unless things change will not be sufficiently newsworthy as to inspire such levels of social solidarity once this is over. The mediated experience of the world people generally consume cannot help but affect profoundly the underlying logic to the reasons anyone does anything. This alongside, of course, the imposition of the logic of capitalism on most people to perform waged labour for most of their lives just to survive. It is not the case that people were indifferent and now they have suddenly found their calling. It's that the logic of capitalism determines what makes the headlines as investors and media require that the company they invested in experiences share price growth continuously. This pressure requires the company to opt for the sort of news that incites passion in the consumer, allows them to feel things, to sense life. It must be sensational. Constantly. If a media company was to report continuously on the sort of human vulnerability that might inspire social solidarity, its readership will flag, leading investors to cash in and invest elsewhere. This competitive drive is the essence of the logic of capitalism, and in this way, one of many, it determines so much of our society. Returning now to the articles mentioned above, published between March 19th and March 31st, in particular, the Wall Street Journal's projection that 10 million will lose their jobs and their ability to realise their dreams, Trump's tweet that the cure cannot be worse than the problem, the Financial Times' claim that shutting industry could inflict lasting damage on the economy, and the World Bank's warning that the 24 million people they predicted would escape poverty this year will no longer do so. The elements involved here are people and wealth. The relationship between them is determined by processes. Under capitalist logic, the process is... The people will slowly attain a share of the wealth by engaging in the economy. The economy that is served by people, not the one that serves people, as highlighted by Chancellor Sunak. This is the capitalist economy, the free market. Under competition with virus logic, this logic comes to reason that the people will not attain a share of the wealth as lockdown will disturb the free market. The elements remain unchanged. Under lockdown or otherwise, the people exist the wealth exists. It's just the interplay of logics that determine the relationship between those elements. Under the competition imposed by virus logic, the transfer of wealth to the poor can no longer be achieved under capitalist logic because the prime value or reason determining the process that manages that relationship is the free market. 
In a capitalist economy, the industry mentioned in the Financial Times article has developed an organic network of production directed by free market price signals. In shutting industry down, the lasting damage the Financial Times alludes to is in the relationships between nodal points on that network, who, after some time, will have failed to perform that relationship and may no longer do so once the possibility arises once more. The quality of these relationships is based on the conditions of competition, the ones I mentioned previously that deliver such quality media companies. The extended logic then is that we cannot simply place element wealth alongside element people, as this will disturb the free market as I just outlined it. To do so is illogical. But now, virus realism is disturbing this process, and the poor people will have to suffer under the totality of that logic, as if this manner of distributing wealth is the best humanity could possibly come up with. In sum then, the quality of industrial relations, as we have seen, are not that brilliant. The process is so feeble that it is unable to withstand lockdown. Its ability to distribute wealth is negligent. Why is everyone so poor to begin with? So why do we uphold its logic and its prime value, the free market economy? Because the class with power in society has invested in the process and they demand a return on it in both the near future and further down the line. What if instead of valuing the free market, instead of valuing the expansion of the economy that valorizes invested capital, we swapped it for a new prime value? That of, not expansion, but distribution. We could outline an economy that serves people rather than the other way around. We could build a production chain robust enough to adapt to crises such as this pandemic, so long as it relied on social rather than capital relations. It would no longer be an illogical act to simply place the existing wealth beside the people who need it. Under this logic, if under it we had an actually free press, headlines could instead read, the 24 million people capitalists decided would gradually escape poverty this year will no longer do so as those capitalists have instead decided to withdraw their wealth from circulation because the government has suggested that people's welfare is slightly more pressing than this economic nonsense. Or, people's dreams are shattered as capital is withdrawn from the economy due to fear and greed by the capitalist class. There is no scarcity of wealth. There is no reason that we cannot distribute wealth evenly in society where it is needed. There is no reason for this other than the logic of capitalism.